dann herzlich willkommen, guten Abend. Herzlich willkommen zum Auftakt unserer Vortragsreihe zur Sonderausstellung Stonehenge von Menschen und Landschaften. Wir freuen uns sehr, heute den Co-Kurator unserer Ausstellung begrüßen zu dürfen, Julian Richards, der uns die Geschichte von Stonehenge näher bringen wird, soweit man sie nach dem heutigen Kenntnisstand erzählen kann. Ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich hier im Vortragssaal bei uns im RWL Museum für Archäologie in Herne, aber auch ähm, zu Hause im Livestream. Mein Name ist Tabea Malter, ich bin wissenschaftliche Volontärin für das Projekt Stonehenge und ähm, ich werde so gut ich kann durch den Abend führen. Ich werde aber immer wieder wechseln zwischen Deutsch und Englisch, also ich bitte Sie um Geduld, wenn ich dann Sachen auch noch mal wiederhole auf Englisch. So, welcome to the start of our lecture series for the special exhibition Stonehenge, People and Landscapes. We are very happy to welcome our co-curator today, Julian Richards, um, who will tell us the story of Stonehenge as far as we know it today. And welcome here in the lecture hall at, at the Museum of Archaeology in Herne and also at home in the live stream. My name is Tabea Malta. I'm scientific trainee for the special exhibition Stonehenge and I will host the evening, so to say. Um, But before I give the floor to uh, Julian Richards, I will uh, briefly introduce him. Julian Richards studied prehistory at Reading University and has been a professional archaeologist since 1975. For example, he worked for Wessex Archaeology and ran the Stonehenge Environs project there, um, which was a detailed study of Stonehenge and its surrounding landscape. Also, he worked, for example, for English Heritage on the Monuments Protection Program. To the public, he became well known through several TV programs, for example, among others, the series Secrets of Lost Empires, where he explored how Stonehenge was built. He has written several books on the subject of Stonehenge, and he's giving talks and teaching evening classes for more than 40 years. He's also curated several exhibitions on Stonehenge, and last but maybe not least, uh, our exhibition here in Herne. And, um, He and his company, Archimedia, um, played a very important role in developing the concept of the exhibition. He um, has been responsible for all the English parts of the exhibition and um, also managed the loans together with our partner museums in Great Britain. Um, he also contributed to the exhibition as a lender himself. And besides all of that, he was also editor and author for the catalog that is accompanying the, the exhibition. He's been an ever helpful and reliable advisor to us and has enriched the project enormously with his expertise. Unfortunately, due to Corona, he has not been able to come to Herne yet, so he hasn't seen the finished exhibition himself, but we hope very much that we can welcome him here in the course of the year. And now I will briefly summarize um, what I've just said in German again. Also, before I um, Herrn Richards jetzt das Wort erteile, noch mal äh, kurz die Vorstellung auch auf Deutsch. Er hat äh, Vorgeschichte an der Universität Reading studiert und ist seit 1975 als Archäologe tätig. Er hat unter anderem für Wessex Archaeology gearbeitet, wo er das Stonehenge Environs Projekt, äh, Projekt geleitet hat, das ähm, eine detaillierte Studie zu Stonehenge, zu dem Monument selbst und der umgebenden Landschaft war. Der Öffentlichkeit wurde er vor allem durch einige Fernsehsendungen bekannt, ähm, unter anderem die Serie Secrets of Lost Empires, in der er erforschte, wie Stonehenge gebaut worden ist. Er hat auch mehrere Bücher über das Thema äh, geschrieben und gibt seit über 40 Jahren Vorträge und ähm, Abendkurse dazu. Außerdem hat er mehrere Ausstellungen zu Stonehenge kuratiert, unter anderem vielleicht ähm, nicht zum letzten Mal auch hier in Herne unsere Ausstellung. Mit seiner Firma Archimedia hat er eine sehr wichtige Rolle bei der Entwicklung des Konzepts gespielt. Er hat all die englischen Teile der Ausstellung verantwortet und uns auch im Leihverkehr stark unterstützt, gemeinsam mit den englischen Partnermuseen. Er ist außerdem neben all dem auch noch Herausgeber und Autor des Katalogs zur Ausstellung und war uns ein immer sehr hilfreicher und zuverlässiger Berater, der das Projekt mit seinem Fachwissen enorm bereichert hat. Jetzt möchte ich aber endlich an den Referenten abgeben, Julian. The stage is yours. So tell us Thank the you. story of Stonehenge so far. Please. Thank you. Well, um, 
I'm sorry I can't be with you in person <laughs> in the museum, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing the exhibition eventually when, uh, when circumstances are slightly different. But I'd just like to say how much I've enjoyed working with the, the team at the museum and, and the other collaborators and our English museum partners to actually put this exhibition together. It's been a real pleasure. Just a shame that I wasn't actually able to be in Germany as much as I had hoped for. Um, before I start and explain what I'm hoping to do, um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of my archaeological colleagues who I've discussed many of these points with over the years and also for the illustrations that are in this lecture. Um, I'd like to thank English Heritage, Historic England and individually um, Simon Banton, Adam Stanford and for his wonderful reconstructions, Peter Dunn. So thank you to all of them for allowing me to use these images. Um, in, when I talk about Stonehenge when I'm here in England, and I'm actually in Shaftesbury in Dorset, about 20 miles down the road from, from Stonehenge, I'm, you know, I'm aware that everybody knows about it, and most people have actually been to see it. Um, I hope if you haven't been to see the real thing, once you've seen this exhibition, you might at some stage um, come and visit uh, England and, and have a look at the real Stonehenge and explore the landscape around it in reality, in the way that it's been explored virtually to help to put this exhibition together. Um, my involvement with this landscape started the 40 years ago when I directed, as Tavier has said, the Stonehenge Environs Project, examining the whole landscape around Stonehenge. This was my first excavation of a small henge monument um, on Coneybury Hill in 1980. Um, at a time when I was willing to be photographed wearing skimpy denim shorts, shoveling out of a very deep ditch. Um, things have changed very much since then, including health and safety regulations getting a bit better. But that was the start of my involvement with Stonehenge, which has fascinated me ever since. Um, one of the things that I think we sometimes think about Stonehenge is that it is just the stones. It's just the central stones. It's not, as I will explain as, as we go on um, through this lecture, the title of which is Stonehenge, the story so far, because that's a very deliberate title. It's the title of a book that I wrote originally about 14 years ago and revised a few years ago because it has got a fascinating story, but it is the story so far. It's not at an end. Every new discovery, every new scientific development helps us to understand the monument people that built it and the world that they inhabited much better. So I don't know whether I'll ever write a third edition of Stonehenge, the story so far, but it was a very deliberate title. What this wonderful photograph taken in the snow shows very clearly is that Stonehenge isn't just those central stones. There are peripheral stones, there's circular ditch, there is a main entrance, and I hope you can see the lines running off into the horizon, the, the first stage of the avenue. So it is, a, it is a complex structure. And one of the things that I want to address is just what, what is Stonehenge before moving on to the other big questions of when it was built, how it was built, and perhaps the most difficult of all, why it was built, because that's the one that involves us trying to understand the prehistoric mind. There are two sorts of stones in these central structures. It's a common misconception. You hear it all the time from visitors going, oh, all the stones have come from Wales. They haven't. These large stones here that you can see in this image, these are some of the sarsens that come from the Marlborough Downs, about 20 miles to the north in, in, in North Wiltshire. And where recent studies has actually pinpointed more precisely the location where most of these stones come from. The smaller stones that are dwarfed by this massive structure, those are some of the stones that come from Wales. That's 125 miles, 200 kilometres to the west. So an incredible journey. And when you look at them today, they seem very similar because this is the product of 4,000 more or more years of erosion and the growth of lichen and mould on the surface of the stones. But when first erected and when first worked, they would have looked very different. The sarsens would have been pale, almost glistening, um, and the blue stones, the majority of them, of this type of rock called spotted dolerite, would have been very, very distinctive, very different from those big sarsens. 
So that's that's one of the fundamental things about structure of Stonehenge. And there are several aspects of this structure that make it unique. There is nothing else like it. For a start, no other stone circle in the British Isles has stones that are brought from anything like the distance that these stones have travelled. And you will still occasionally hear arguments that the blue stones were brought to Salisbury Plain not by human transport but by glacial activity. But this is generally not accepted now. It's generally accepted that it was human motivation and transport that brought the stones there. So there's no other stone circle that has stones that are brought from a distance. There is no other stone circle where the stones are shaped. They are not just naturally selected pillars, albeit maybe selected to be uniform. They have been modified and they have been shaped. And it is the only stone circle in the British Isles where the upright stones are capped with these horizontal lintels. And when you look at those central stone structures from the entrance, from the main entrance. This is the one that runs out into the line of the avenue. There is a, a tremendous symmetry. There is an architectural quality to the structure, which you simply don't get in any other stone circle. And when you approach it, and I suppose really now I'm, I'm taking you on the tour that I like to lead people on when I'm taking them into the stones, you go through the entrance past the stone that lies in the grass to the left there known as the slaughter stone but actually nothing to do with slaughter or human sacrifice it's it originally stood upright so it couldn't have been a sacrificial altar um you, what you approach then is the first element of these complex central stone structures which is a circle a circle of sarsens which if complete and we cannot be a hundred percent certain about this would have consisted of 30 of these upright stones and 30 horizontal lintels. When you approach it, the symmetry becomes more obvious. The stones have their sides and their faces shaped, smoothed, and the lintels that sit on top of them aren't just straight blocks of stone. Their inner and outer faces are worked into a gentle curve. But what you don't realise when you see it from this sort of angle is that the stone in, an, in an, an, an extra layer of, of complexity are jointed together. That those uprights, by removing stone, have left these lumps sticking up, which fit into holes on the underside of the horizontal lintels. And then the ends of those lintels are joined together with a, another joint that is very reminiscent of woodworking. Now, this... These stones were erected about four and a half thousand years ago. So is it, this is at the very end of the Neolithic period. The only tools available to the people at that time to work these stones were other pieces of stone. And we have found these at Stonehenge in excavation lumps. And there are some on display in the exhibition ranging from the, the size of a, an orange to some the size of a football used simply to batter away at the surface and remove chips of stone and sand to create these elaborate joints. So this is a very complicated structure in its own right is this outer circle. And then inside that and parallel to it is a circle of the smaller Welsh stones, a mixture of rocks of various types and these not worked because in Wales the stone splits into natural pillars and so these are unshaped stones. The 19th century antiquarian Sir Richard Colt Hall rather rudely referred to this circle as the pygmy pillars. But, you know, they have come from a very long way, even though they are smaller than the Tarsen. Then inside those two circles, there are two horseshoe shapes. The first of them consisting of five, originally five, of these huge structures. This is a, a trilithon, trilithos from the Greek, three stones, two upright and one horizontal across the top. These are massive. Some of the uprights here weigh nearly 40 tonnes and the lintel themselves about 10 tonnes. And what's intriguing is that each of these trilithons, the two uprights, one is very smooth and the other is not quite as well worked. 
And this seems to be deliberate. It's not a question of not bothering to finish something off. But it's difficult to understand what it means. Perhaps it's been suggested one is a tamed stone, one is art, the other is nature, well, there's a more natural stone. But it can be seen in all of the uprights, the pairs of uprights around this horseshoe trellisum. This is the, the lintel that, that's come off the tallest of those trellisums at the back of the, the back of that horseshoe and lies on top of a, a slab of stone. You can just see it poking out underneath that lintel. Um, this is the altar stone, which is also from Wales, but from a different part of Wales. And it's a very different sort of stone. And running, it, again, parallel with that horseshoe of Trillithons, you have a horseshoe of upright, finely worked bluestone pillars. So in terms of its structure, it might look complicated when you see it as it is today, as a ruin, but it is simply two circles and two horseshoes, an outer circle of sarsens, an inner circle of bluestones, a horseshoe of sarsen trillithons, a horseshoe of bluestones. And then at the focal point, this stone known as the altar stone, and given its name, because if this is a temple, which many people see it as, then that is the logical position for the altar to be. So that's the basic structure. What we know is that the blue stones have been moved. Once those sarsen stones are in position, that's it. They're not going to be moved. But the blue stones being smaller, up to about four tons in weight, and therefore more portable, have been rearranged. So we see them in their final arrangement. Their earlier position has been determined from excavation. It's intriguing that many early archaeologists and antiquarians saw Stonehenge as something Roman, because to them it was too sophisticated to be the product of the, the ancient Britons, because people regarded these the native inhabitants of Britain as somehow primitive and, and savage, and they couldn't have built something as sophisticated as Stonehenge. And this was something that persisted for a very long period of time before it was realised that it was actually a product of those of those early Britons. What we know about Stonehenge, apart from studying the structure that exists today, has obviously been derived from excavation. And there were early attempts at excavation in the 18th and the 19th century, but that was more random hole digging, often on the assumption that in a structure of this significance, there must be something important buried there. You know, in the center of this, there was going to be treasure. Whereas what these early archeologists found or early treasure hunters found, they, they often said, we found stag's horns. Well, those are antler picks, deer antler picks that were used to dig the holes, the ditch and, the, and dig the holes for the stones no treasure. The first scientific excavation was carried out in 1901 when the tallest of the sarsen uprights, which was leaning at a very crazy angle, was straightened up and a small excavation was carried out at the base of that stone by Professor Gowland, the, the gentleman with the very fine moustache who's, who's at the base of the stone. It was a small excavation but it was very scientific um, his workmen are sieving soil, they are measuring the position of every find, and it was promptly written up. And Gowland's deduction was that that stone was put up at the end of the age of stone or the beginning of the age of bronze, for which he was absolutely right. He thought that was around 1800 BC. We now know because of radiocarbon dating that it's more like 2500 BC, but it was a very small and very scientific excavation. After Stonehenge donated to the nation in 1918, there was a more extensive programme of excavation, um, remedying, again, leaning stones. And Colonel Hawley, the excavator at this stage, was also tasked with excavating the whole of Stonehenge. This was his job from the Society of Antiquaries. He didn't complete it, but he did excavate extensively the ditch and inside the stones 
um, for many years, publishing small interim reports, but never actually writing up all the results of his excavation. And then the next major phase of excavation happened in the 1950s and the 1960s. This huge excavation here, and this massive engineering works, was to re-erect one of the trilithons that had fallen over in 1797, and it was decided to raise it again. So this involved a large excavation of the area where the fallen stones had lain. You can see from the photograph the complexity of the below ground archaeology here, pits, hollows, stones, for, holes for stones, holes for stones that are no longer there. Sadly, the excavation was never written up properly and it wasn't until after uh, Richard Atkinson had died that the results of this came to publication, which is a tragedy really for a site of the importance of Stonehenge. So we had a, a lot of older excavations and more recent years, we've had some very small scale, but quite targeted excavations. This one carried out in 2008 by Bournemouth University, Professor Timothy Darville and Professor Jeff Wainwright, who excavated in the centre of the stones to try and determine the time at which those blue stones had first arrived on site. And what you can see from this small trench is again, how disturbed everything is and how some of the blue stones can see in the corner of the trench one that's been broken off above ground level and survives only as a, a stump below ground. So a complicated sequence there and this was the last excavation of any scale that happened in the centre. What you can see is that a lot of Stonehenge has been excavated. That pale blue colour is all of what Hawley did, the red is the work that Atkinson did in the centre of the stones there. So there's about <clears throat> half of the monument remaining undisturbed and whether anybody will be allowed to carry out any more modern research excavations there um, is, is very much up to um, English heritage to decide as the, as the custodians and the guardians of the site, but there are still unanswered questions. What we've been able to deduce from all of these excavations is a broad sequence of events. The first stage of which is the digging of the ditch and the raising of the bank. Now this Stonehenge, you would think that it was a henge and the term in British archaeology is generally applied to an enclosure. One of its characteristics is that it has its bank outside its ditch. Now Stonehenge doesn't fit with this. Stonehenge has its ditch outside its bank. So from that point of view, this original earthwork isn't really a proper henge. Um, it's more like in some ways types of earlier Neolithic enclosures, um, causewayed enclosures where the ditch is dug as a series of segments and the bank again exists as a series of segments. So it's, it's a sort of halfway house between these two types of Neolithic enclosure. This, the ditch was dug sometime just after 3000 BC, between about 3000 and 2900 BC. And we're not 100% certain as to exactly what was also going on at that time. What we know is that shortly after this, or the argument goes, is that shortly after this, the bluestones arrived from Wales. And recent work, very you know, detailed geological and archaeological work by Mike Parker Pearson and his team of specialist geologists, Rob Ixer and, and others, have pinpointed a number of sites in the Preselles where these stones come from. Originally, it was thought that most of them came from the one on the top left, which is Carn Menin. We now know that the top right, Carn Godog, has also produced some stone, and also the bottom left one, Craig Rossifelin, that again, stones from that very rock face have ended up at Stonehenge. But there is still debate about whether they arrived early in the whole Stonehenge sequence. There's some reconstruction of what happens shortly after that ditch and bank are raised show posts, wooden posts, in a series of pits which have been revealed by excavation just inside the bank, 
known as the Aubrey Holes after their discoverer, the 17th century antiquarian John Aubrey. And so some people suggest that those holes held wooden posts and that there were other wooden structures in the centre and in the entrance. But there is an alternative suggestion, and that is that those holes hold wooden posts but held some of the blue stones from Wales and that they arrived there before the big sarsens arrived in the centre. Now this is one of those areas that is open to debate. The proof that the blue stones were there early isn't isn't there. Um, there are hints, there are suggestions, but this is something that we can't actually be 100% certain about. The most recent excavation of one of these Aubrey holes was carried out in 2008, mainly to retrieve from it a, de a large deposit of cremated human bones that had been reburied there. Because one of the things that Colonel Hawley discovered in his excavations of these Aubrey holes and in the ditch as well, is that there were deposits of, deposits of cremated human bones. But in the 1920s, nobody knew what to do with this. It wasn't thought that it would provide any information. And so in 1935, it was simply all dumped back in one of the excavated Aubrey holes. This was re-excavated by Mike Parker Pearson's team. Uh, I helped with that excavation in 2008. And this has been used, the base of this stone, of this hole, has been suggested as showing evidence that it once held a stone an upright stone. I'm not 100% convinced, to be quite honest. I, I dug the bottom of the pit. I'm not so certain that the evidence is there. So the jury is out on that one. Also, another bit of supporting evidence, the suggested supporting evidence for the blue stones being in the Stonehenge landscape at an early stage, has come from a site that was excavated, found and excavated by Mark Parker Pearson's Stonehenge Riverside project near the village of West Amesbury, where the avenue finally joins the River Avon. And here they discovered a henge, a small earthwork enclosure, with a series of pits inside it, which they interpret, Mike's team interpret, as having held blue stones, upright stones. My only suggestion there is that not a single fragment of bluestone was found on site. So again, it's an interesting idea, but I'm personally not convinced by the evidence. And this is a site, this is one of Peter Dunn's re excellent reconstructions that's often referred to as bluestone henge, but sadly it's bluestone henge without the bluestones. So it's more commonly known as West Amesbury henge. So there are a lot of areas here where we're, where we're uncertain about exactly what was going on. This is the suggested arrangement of those blue stones when they first appeared. And this shows the, the sarsen structures, which were built about 2500 BC, and the blue stones in their original configuration. Uh, a double circle. And also, if you look carefully, you'll see there are some miniature trilithons, smaller trilithons of bluestone in this setting here. Now, the evidence for that can be seen on site. This is a fallen bluestone pillar, which was obviously originally a horizontal lintel, because that dark dot there is a mortise hole. And there is another one at the end of that stone. And in excavations in the 1950s, this stone was found buried as well. Another lintel with its two mortise holes. So somewhere, some of the blue stones stood as these miniature trilithons. But was it at Stonehenge or might it even have been in Wales? Because one of the things that I've suggested for a long while and other people are very happy to agree with is that what came from Wales was not simply a collection of building material, but was a dismantled stone circle. And maybe that stone circle in Wales had these miniature trilithons that inspired the much bigger ones that we see in Sarsen at Stonehenge. 
So, as you probably gathered, you would expect that with a site like Stonehenge, everything would be absolutely cut and dried and we didn't know everything about it. We don't. There are still some areas that are open for discussion. We know that these blue stones come from the Preseli Hills in Wales. Calling them the Preseli Mountains is perhaps a little much. They are the Preseli Hills. The route that those stones took to get to Stonehenge, again, is uncertain because we have no evidence along the way. What we've always hoped that we would find is somewhere where somebody dropped a stone on the way or one fell off a raft uh, into a river and we could find it again, but it, it hasn't happened. So various routes involving the coast round the sea have been suggested. I've never been convinced that they went all the way around the end of Cornwall. That's actually a long and very dangerous journey. And it's possible that from the Priscelli Hills that they went overland that they went slightly more north and overland probably had to cross the Bristol Channel somewhere so there would have been a water element and from there to Stonehenge but we don't know the precise route we don't know whether one group of people moved one stone all the way from one place to the other or whether stones were passed on through what you could regard as people's territory that people were responsible for moving this stone on and that they were therefore all part of this this great scheme this grand scheme to construct stonehenge which would have united people over a very large area so again uncertainty the sarsons we know that they come from the marlborough downs it was thought originally that this area around the the great stone circle of avebury was probably where they came from but more recent study more recent scientific analysis of these sarsen stones which are a type of very hard sandstone with the grains cemented together um, by silica has shown that there's an area called west woods which is nearer the town of marlborough maybe 10 12 kilometers to the east which is probably where most of the sarsens came from but again no trace of that route which has to cross a, a river valley and then climb up onto the chalk of Salisbury Plain. And there is a very steep slope to get up onto Salisbury Plain, which would have been the most challenging aspect of trying to move these stones, some of which, as I say, weigh about 40 tonnes. So there's, there's our structure again, our two circles, our two horseshoes, and some idea of the dating. We know that the Sarsons were put up around 2500 BC. The blue stones were rearranged two or three centuries after that. And then there isn't any great modification of the structure until about 1600 BC. So several centuries after this and well into the, the middle part, the Bronze Age, when two circles of pits are dug around the outside of the stones which marks the last obvious modification of the site. So it has a 1,400-year history from the time that ditch was first dug to when those last pits were excavated. What we don't know is how long after that it carried on being, being used, it carried on being important. But the landscape around it is certainly changing at this time from one which is essentially sacred and for ceremony and burial to one where more normal aspects of everyday life are carried out. There are, to go back to that, there are questions as to whether this was completed. Because if you look down at the, at the bottom, if you look down uh, on the south side of the plan here, and you'll find a little stone that says 11 because all these have got numbers. They were all numbered by the archaeologist Flinders Petrie in the late Victorian period. Now, Stone 11 is a problem because it's that one there that's poking out at a slight angle because it's in the right place to be a stone of the outer circle, but it's far too small and it doesn't look as if it's been actually modified where it stands. So that's one of the indications that maybe although the design appears to be coherent, that it wasn't ever finished in the way it was intended to be. This, though, is what we think we have 
you know, at the end, this is the this is the final Stonehenge. Those central stone structures with the re re relocated blue stones, the two, the four station stones which lie just inside the inner edge of the the ditch, and in the entrance, the remains of some of the stone st structures that originally stood there, and the heel stone surrounded by a ditch. So this is our our last Stonehenge. Now. Let's move on to the question of who built it, because I've already shown that antiquarians were quite happy to suggest that it was built by the Romans because it was very sophisticated. And you will find um, strange theories suggesting that Stonehenge was built by people from outer space. Um, but this is not this is not the case. Um, it's sometimes quite tempting to look at individuals and say this person had a hand in the construction of Stonehenge. And one particular person, one particular very spectacular burial that was found about 20 years ago has often been associated with the building of Stonehenge, or in fact the rebuilding at this time when the, the main stone structures went up. And this is a person called the Amesbury Archer. And he's called the Amesbury Archer because he was found um, outside the village of, of the town of Amesbury, which is about to four kilometres away from Stonehenge. And he is the richest Beaker period burial that's ever been found in the British Isles. Because he has, and you'll see examples of these wonderful beakers in the in the exhibition, um, he has everything. He has several beautifully made beaker pots. He has fine flint arrowheads. He has other archery equipment in the form of stone wrist guards, which again are, are seen as being archery equipment. And significantly, he has some of the earliest metal found in the British Isles, little copper daggers and gold hair ornaments. Very, very rich, very prestigious, buried around 2400 BC. And intriguingly, an analysis of his bones, analysis of isotopes in his bones showed that he had come from mainland Europe, from continental Europe, which is hardly surprising given how early this is in the in the metal age and the richness of the grave goods he had there. And there are even hints that he might himself be a metal worker because he has a stone there that appears to be a metal worker's anvil. But intriguingly, he was suggested that, you know, yes, he was European. And initially it was suggested that he might be from Germany. So, you know, he was an immigrant from Europe. And then a tabloid press in Britain got hold of this and got very excited about the fact that, that the Amesbury Archer might be from Germany. So this is how I'm afraid our English press represented this. Steinhenge, Great British monument may have been built by a German, complete with, I'm sorry, the sort of um, rather stereotypical view of a of a German person. This is not this is this is not what I would uh, <laughs> hasten to in endorse. This is our the lowest of our press. Now he does come from Europe. I don't, we don't think that he's actually from Germany. He's probably from the sort of Alpine area. He's probably more Swiss than anything else. But he still has that, the suggestions have been made that he is somehow something to do with this rebuilding of Stonehenge. I don't think it works because actually he is just a bit too late. And also as somebody wealthy, influential, bringing a new technology, which would have been stunning to people who are used to simply working stone. The idea that this person can melt rock and pour metal and create these wonderful things. Very rich, very prestigious, but not anything to do with this construction of Stonehenge. And the fact that he's buried several kilometres away, I think, again, is, is another clue. So people still tend to look for an individual. But one of the things that we don't have at the time that Stonehenge is being rebuilt is burials of wealthy, individual, prestigious, powerful people. We don't know where they are because those cremation burials predate this. So we have a bit of a puzzle. It's an anonymous monument in terms of who built it. Now, this card used to be sold by English Heritage at Stonehenge. 
um, I think they withdrew it because um, it says how they built Stonehenge. And I think some people actually went away thinking that dinosaurs were used in the construction of Stonehenge, which clearly they weren't. But this again is one of the is one of the puzzles because archaeology is a science. We rely on clues, on empirical evidence. We can date things by using radiocarbon dating. We can see where people have moved from and come from by using isotopes. Um, we can study the structures and the geology. But how something like Stonehenge was built, it's finding the clues that is the problem. And if we look at this reconstruction that was done by English Heritage a few years ago, we can see the problem because if you look at what's being used here, wooden rollers, uh, A-frames, ropes, levers, none of this survives in a dry environment. All of this is organic material, organic ropes, timber. We don't have any of these clues. The only solid clues we have about how Stonehenge was built are these stone hammers that I've already described and the antler picks, the picks of deer antler that was used to dig the holes which are very useful for radiocarbon dating. So all we can realistically do is experiment. And if an experiment works, that is a way that it could have been done. It's not the way that it was done. So as Bear explained at the beginning, um, the first television programme I was involved in about Stonehenge was how you build it. And it was at a time when the BBC had sufficient funds to make two 40 tonne blocks of concrete representing the uprights of one of the big trilithons and a 10 tonne lintel. And our job, um, an engineer and myself, was to devise ways in which it could have been moved and the stones put up. So Mark Whitby, the engineer, devised a simple sledge and we proved that you could move this stone using about 140 people. And this is up a slight slope. And every time I see this picture, I do wonder what the three people who are pushing at the back um, actually thought that they were achieving, but they obviously wanted to help in some way. So we had a way using this sledge. I think it was over engineered because it did cause its own problems, but it was it demonstrated that this was a way of doing it and that you needed about 140 people. The people have suggested simply the use of levers, that stones are levered along. They're, they're moved along one sort of jump at a time. This is a group called the Stone Engineers demonstrating what they call stone rowing. That's another possibility, but it's very slow and they've not tried it with a 40 tonne stone. That one only weighs 12 tonnes. Um, recently, um, Exeter University decided on a very elaborate scheme using wooden rails and stone ball bearings, round stones, which would help to roll the thing along. A bit of a problem here in that we simply don't have the round stones um, to suggest that this might have been a method that was used. And again, I think it's over engineered. Um, this, perhaps the what struck me as the most dangerous method of all is um, this, the, the bedlam roller invented by a gentleman called Bruce Bedlam, in which you encase the stone in a giant wooden roller, which I think would be terrifying and dangerous. And I'm not convinced um, that that's how it was done. Um, Mr. Bedlam also thinks that the stones were the foundation of a large wooden building, which again, I'm not convinced by. So lots of different suggestions. Only one has been tried out at full scale and it worked, but I'm not saying that that's how it was done. But these people are skilled engineers, they're skilled woodworkers, and they have had practice at moving stones because we find megalithic structures in the, in the early Neolithic, a thousand years or more before this. So they know how to do it. And we're just trying to discover how they did it. I love some of the suggestions that appear on the internet. Um, this one um, from, I think, a Russian, I'm not sure whether it's an archaeologist, suggested that you floated the stones uh, to Stonehenge on little wood, on little rafts. Um, now, the slight problem here in that Stonehenge is built on chalk, 
which is possibly the most porous rock that you can get and it's also on the top of a hill so I'm not quite sure how you'd get the water to uh, to flow uphill but it doesn't stop people using their imagination. We tried using the traditional method of levering up the lintels supported on a platform of timbers and I still think that this is the way that it was done because you can create a stable platform on which you can do the final adjustment, the final working of the stone to get it to sit on top of the upright. So I'm still convinced that this is the way that the lintels were put on the top, not as has been suggested by using some peculiar sort of wooden railway or by using the wonderfully named litho lift or stone lift um, whereby you put the lintel on a giant wooden wheel which you pull along and it simply plonks the stone on top of the uprights. Again, utterly terrifying, amazingly dangerous and I would really love to see somebody demonstrate this at full scale as long as I was a long distance away from it. So really, we don't know exactly how Stonehenge was built but no doubt hopefully people will carry on having ideas and carry on expensive uh, experimenting now when we come to the why this is very interesting and there are a number of different opinions and theories about why the effort goes into to building this monument and two of the main proponents are archaeological colleagues and friends of mine mike parker pearson on the left tim darville on the right and so in a in a, a critical way, maybe, I'm going to go through and look at some of the, the ideas that, that they put forward. Mike is firmly in the belief that Stonehenge is a place of the dead, that stones are for the dead. And this is largely as a result of taking a, a Madagascan colleague, Ramisalina, to Stonehenge many years ago. And Ramel said, in Madagascar, timber is for the living, and stone is for the dead. Stonehenge is a place of stone, therefore it is a place of the dead. And that is a very interesting idea because yes, in Madagascar, contemporary Madagascan society, there is that association, but it's not quite as, as cut and dried as, as that. I mean, I think there are suggestions that hard woods can also be seen as, as ancestral and also, in uh, ethnographic evidence, taking evidence from contemporary cultures is very useful and can give us huge insights. But it always worries me that to take something and apply it directly and go what's going on in present day and historic Madagascar is what was going on in Neolithic Wessex worries me slightly. But it's it's definitely an idea. And so if Stonehenge is a place of the dead, then there needs to be a corresponding place of the living. And one of the most remarkable discoveries that was made by Mike and his Stonehenge Riverside project was something that I'd spent years trying to find in doing the field work that I was doing around the Stonehenge landscape. And that is the places where people were living at the time that Stonehenge was built. Because by combination of, uh, of astute research and very good luck, when they were excavating at a huge monument called Durrington Walls, which is another Henge monument close to the river, about four kilometres away from Stonehenge, they found evidence for houses, the first Neolithic houses to be found in the landscape. And they're very consistent in their plan. They have a, a chalk floor with a central hearth. And then at a distance from that, there are the posts and the stakes of timber walls. And obviously everything else has survived, but they're very consistent in the way that they're built and they all date to around 2500 BC, the time that Stonehenge was being rebuilt in stone. If you go to the visitor centre at Stonehenge today, you can see reconstructions of some of these houses built on the footprint or the plans that were produced um, from the archaeological excavation. And again, showing different types of roof thatch because we can't be certain how it was done. So you, you try different methods. So this is effectively what people were living in. And it's been suggested that these may be the houses of the builders of Stonehenge because they do fit together in terms of date. There's 
there is debate about how many of these houses were were, were there. Mike has at times suggested that there is a very, very extensive village with maybe even hundreds of houses, you know, but, you know, the evidence, you know, is there for a number of houses, but we don't quite know how extensive the settlement was. And what we do know is that it was occupied before the huge earthwork was built there, because it was that earthwork that buried the remains of some of the houses. So this is a place of the living. And there are timber circles within that landscape, within this site and close by at a place called Woodhenge. So that works. Timber for the living, stone for the dead. And yes, Stonehenge, as I've said already, is a place of the dead because the Aubrey holes, the ones here that have got a, a red dot on them that were excavated by Colonel Hawley, you can see almost entirely did have cremated human bones in them. So it is a cemetery, but at an early stage because radiocarbon dating of these cremated human bones from the recent excavations has shown that the majority of them lie within about the first 300 to even 400 years of Stonehenge's life. So before the main rebuilding in Sarsen happens. So it is a cemetery, but perhaps not at the right time. This is the excavation of that Aubrey hole. And you can see we're just now coming down onto the deposit of human bones. Sadly, the excavators, um, the original excavators, had just simply tipped all the bags of bone out into the pit. So there was a huge deposit of totally mixed up cremated human bone. And if you're used to seeing a modern cremation, these ancient ones are totally different because there is no crushing up of the bone. So you can find recognisable fragments. You can see on the right hand side there, the end of a femur, the end of a thigh bone, the base of a skull. And so a lot can be told about the individuals. We know that there is at least 60 people buried there. And in more recent times, it's been possible to do isotope analysis on them, which shows that some of them have not are not local to the area, that some of them may have actually come from areas of geology that are reminiscent of Wales. So very intriguing. So it is a cemetery. Mike's overall scheme for landscape, and I'm sorry about this, it might look a little bit complicated, but you can see the domain of the living. This is Durrington Walls, the, the superhenge with the village, with the timber circles and the houses. And Mike's a suggestion is that when you die at Durrington Walls, you make a journey down the River Avon. You then go up the line of the avenue and you're sort of making a journey from life to death. And then you're buried at the circle of the ancestors. You become one of the ancestors. And it's a very interesting idea. The trouble is it doesn't always work, it work entirely because the dating of the cremation burials at Stonehenge is earlier on the whole than people are living at Durrington Walls. So you can't be living at Durrington and then make this journey and be buried at Stonehenge a couple of centuries earlier. So it's an interesting idea, but I'm not convinced that it works as an overall scheme. Although Stonehenge is, as I've said, a place of the dead in its early stages. Mike has also suggested that the blue stones that, that came to Stonehenge at a very early stage and his recent work has been in Wales at a place called Weimar, where he has been excavating a stone structure which is interpreted as a stone circle, although some people are not even convinced that it is a stone circle. And he's suggesting that this is where the blue stones originally stood before they were uprooted and moved to Stonehenge. It's an interesting idea suggesting that the circle at, at Weimar is the same diameter as the, the ditch and at, at Stonehenge. But again, it's, it's, I think it's stretching the evidence a little bit further than you should realistically stretch it. And there are others as well as myself who aren't convinced that Mike has actually found the place where those blue stones originated. But I'm sure more work will be done and maybe 
you know, in a, the next couple of seasons, I'll be I'll be convinced by it. Timothy Darville, Darville, along with Jeff Wainwright, um, sadly we no longer have Jeff with us. Um, they have another idea, and that is Stonehenge is a place of healing. Something sort of shamanic about Stonehenge, and their idea based again on the blue stones, suggesting that the blue stones are brought from Wales because it's thought that they had healing powers. Because there is folklore in Wales that associates the water that flows over the stone with having healing properties. And it's always interesting to think, you know, is this folklore from historic times that's been passed down, has it got its roots in something much more ancient? Were these stones thought to have these healing powers back in prehistory? And so the suggestion is that you're bringing that healing power to Stonehenge in the form of the stones. And, you know, again, I think we would like to see this, this blue stones arriving here very early. Sadly, the excavations that they carried out in 2008, it was incredibly disturbed. Interestingly, there'd been an awful lot of Roman activity, um, so much so that it suggested that the Romans might even have moved some of the blue stones around and created a, a shrine. Uh, the sheer number, the sheer volume of Roman finds is far greater than you'd expect from just casual visitors. <coughs> so this is their suggestion that it's that it's a place of healing, but it's difficult to prove. And again, they have evoked the same person, the Amesbury Archer, as being supporting evidence, because this is a person who'd had a very severe injury to one of his legs, um, was sort of almost crippled by it. And the suggestion has been made that he came to Stonehenge looking for healing. Now, I'm not convinced that this poor chap would hobbled half the way across Europe to Stonehenge to, to look for to look for healing. Um, interesting idea. The other suggestion that's been made sometimes is that a lot of the Bronze Age burial mounds surrounding Stonehenge um, have evidence for people who are either diseased or have suffered some terrible injury. Now, I'm afraid the evidence simply isn't there for that, because all of these burial mounds were excavated 200 years ago by pioneering archaeologists who were interested in the objects that were contained with these burials. They didn't want the skeletons. They didn't think you could tell anything about them, so they left them there. So we don't have the evidence that some people are suggesting is there from all these people around Stonehenge. All we know, the only consistent factor, is that they're all dead. We don't know whether they're diseased or injured, which might support the idea that people with afflictions were, were coming to Stonehenge. Effectively, really, what they are is they're very wealthy, important people, because the sort of bronze axes and daggers that we find in these burial mounds, these are what are carved symbolically onto the stones at Stonehenge at a time 700 years after the Sarsons have been put up. So that's more the association. The one undeniable fact is that Stonehenge has an orientation. That line from the avenue through the entrance past the heel stone and into the open side of the two horseshoes there, this is the solstice alignment. The line that marks to the northeast the rising sun on the longest day of the year, midsummer, and 180 degrees from that to the southwest, the setting sun on the shortest day of the year, the midwinter solstice. That is built into Stonehenge. And of course, it's a question of what is it, is it winter or summer? Um, until coronavirus happened, English Heritage would allow anybody into Stonehenge at midsummer. Spend the night there and theoretically at dawn go, behold the dawn, behold the sun. English weather being what it is, it was usually raining or misty, but sometimes you get a brilliant sunrise. But realistically, those people are there the wrong time of the year. They should be there midwinter. 
because that is the time that I am convinced that Stonehenge was built to celebrate. If you think about the people who built it, they are pastoralists, they are herders, they're farmers. The winter is a time of fear, of darkness. The days are getting shorter, they're getting darker, colder. The sun, which you know all life depends on, is getting lower in the sky, it's getting weaker. What you want is a signal that the sun is going to resume its journey around the heavens and that the days will get longer, lighter, warmer, and that life will return. And that is the winter solstice. That is the point at which the sun passes through that transitional period and resumes its journey. So I'm convinced that that is the time of year that Stonehenge was built to mark. And, you know, it's it's no coincidence, I think, that although Stonehenge does work, work both ways, you go to Mays Howe in Orkney, you go to Newgrange in Ireland, they only work at midwinter, when the rising sun at midwinter shines into the burial chamber down the stone passage. So, you know, there's supporting evidence for this. Recent laser scanning of the stone shown that that northeast side, what you'd be looking at if you were facing the midwinter sunset is the best side. That's where the stones are largest, most regular, most neatly worked. Round on the southwest, this is where it gets a bit scrappy because effectively you wouldn't be looking at that side. So I think even if you don't uh, agree maybe with the supporting evidence from Durrington Walls where it's suggested that there's evidence for large-scale feasting at midwinter by the culling of large quantities of or killing of large numbers of pigs and great feasts of pork even if you don't use supporting evidence like that I think the evidence just points to it being the winter that is the significant time. Just one final point one of the questions that's often asked is why is Stonehenge where it is? Now, there's a couple of clues, maybe. This stone, this is the heel stone that lies outside the enclosure in the line of the avenue and was originally, up until a few years ago, right by the side of the road that ran past Stonehenge, which has now been closed. It's possible that that heel stone is a very rare natural sarsen within that landscape because there are one or two other small sarsens, not in the quantity that you need to build the sarsen structures. If that was there, not standing, but lying there, it would mark this out as a special place. It's also the suggestion that the line of the avenue, formalised as dug ditches and banks, actually follows some natural geological features. Peri periglacial channels that run down the slope, which coincidentally align perfectly with that solstice alignment. So if you had that stone and these natural features in the landscape, which would show up best in the midwinter in frost and snow, maybe those together are clues as to why that extraordinary structure ended up being built there. But the one thing for all of our scientific advances, for all of our investigations and our analysis, it's very difficult to get into the minds of the people that built something like this. You know, it is the supreme achievement of our prehistoric ancestors. It does unite people from, from all over Britain, really, in terms of the bringing resources and, and manpower into constructing it. But I'm not convinced that we will ever fully understand it. And that, in some ways, is what makes it so fascinating. Now, I've spent 40 years now um, studying Stonehenge, a keen observer of all the work that other people have done, including watching people re-excavate sites that I excavated 35 years ago, which is a slightly alarming prospect, um, and reinterpreting them, which I'm quite happy to do as an archaeologist, things move on. Um, you know, I suppose my mission is to try and persuade as many people as possible that Stonehenge is an utterly fascinating place, uh, full of mystery, full of joy, full of excitement. Um, this is my my favourite of my books that I've written. I mean, I've written the site guidebook and written Stonehenge, the story so far. But to me, the amazing pop up Stonehenge, a way of getting kids interested in Stonehenge is possibly the most important one that I've written so far. Um, 
some of my collection of Stonehenge Yana stuff to do with Stonehenge is on display in the exhibition here. I was very happy to lend it to the museum um, to show how it's been a source of inspiration to artists and musicians and, and potters and all sorts of people over the years. And it has always given me such joy. And being able to collaborate with people like Jeremy Della, one of whose artworks um, is here in the exhibition, um, who created in 2012 what he described as the most stupid artwork ever, but I think is utterly wonderful, which is Sacrilege, the amazing inflatable bouncy stone hedge, which you can see me enjoying in the bottom photograph there. So it has, you know, over these decades, given me so much joy, so much pleasure, so much fascination. Um, it's an amazing place. I'm so glad that you're able to experience some of it um, in the exhibition here at, at Heron. Um, and, you know, as I say, I hope that some of you will come and visit it for real at some stage in the future when the world returns to some sort of normality. So thank you for listening to me. And I'll leave you with um, the, sort of the hedge that I create uh, when I go and talk to primary schools. Uh, this is vegetable and biscuit hedge and as you can see it has the outer sarsen circle with its continuous lintels, the bluestone circle, the five trilithons, the horseshoe of blue stones and here represented by part of a cucumber the altar stone. And if this has taught me anything it's don't try and build things for school children that use edible biscuits because they will eat the biscuits before they finish the building. So Thank you for listening to me. I hope that I've explained the story so far, but it will change. It will evolve because this is what archaeology does. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Julian. Um, thank you for this really uh, interesting and uh, entertaining lecture and um, I think it's always inspiring to see how much you love Stonehenge even after all these years. <laughs> so yes. thanks a lot. Um, I will open the discussion now and people can ask questions here on site and also uh, in the chat of our live stream and I will repeat the questions for Julian Richards and uh, pass them on to him. Also, uh, ich eröffne dann hiermit die Fragerunde. Sie können hier vor Ort oder auch im äh, Chat, im Livestream ähm, Fragen stellen und ich leite die an Herrn Richards weiter oder wiederhole sie für ihn. Es gibt auch ein Mikro hier vor Ort. Trauen Sie sich. <lacht> are there no questions? <lacht> I think people are just shy to talk to you. <lacht> <lacht> okay. I see there are um, reactions in the chat. Uh, terrific presentation, Julian, as always. And thank you very much. It was very interesting. But no questions there. Oh. Maybe you've given the perfect lecture and answered all the questions. Well, no, no, there is no such <laughs> thing as the, uh, there's no such thing as the perfect lecture. <laughs> no, no questions? Have I, have I positively answered everybody's questions about Stonehenge? <laughs> Has a question. Auf Englisch. Oui. Ähm, ich mache auf Deutsch. Yep. Okay. Die Frage, die mir kam, wenn die Blue Stones tatsächlich Heilkräfte haben, mm -hmm. ähm, findet man da Fragmente überall in der Gegend, weil es wäre ja relativ naheliegend, dass Menschen nicht nur zu diesem Ort gehen, sondern von diesem Ort auch etwas mitnehmen. Mm -hmm. Das ist ja etwas, was wir also auch heute kennen, das ist immer ein schlechtes Argument, aber so ein... ein <lacht> Ich sag mal, wir kennen das ja auch im Museum. Es wird gerne mal was mitgenommen, was man schön findet. So ein bisschen. Das ist ja vielleicht etwas, was im Menschen liegt. Das würde mich interessieren. So, there was a question. I think you couldn't hear it. Um, I will just uh, repeat and translate it for you. Um, so, the question is on uh, the idea or the theory that the blue stones um, were thought to have healing powers. And... Um, um, now we are wondering whether um, there are findings of um, fragments of the blue stones or chips of the blue stones um, in the area of Stonehenge, around Stonehenge, or whether you can see that there are 
um, parts of the bluestones um, removed, since we can imagine that people um, thought if they have healing powers, they wanted to take a part of Stonehenge with them. As we know of today, maybe our society today is a bit different there, that we know that from the museum, that people like to take uh, things um, with them yes. that they like. Yeah. But is there any evidence of that or any um, hint for well, something like that? I mean, this is, this is one of the suggestions as to why some of the blue stones have been broken up because mm. if you remember that excavation photograph you know there was just a stump of it, of it showing above ground um there are some fragments of blue stone within the landscape but um not in a, i mean one of the problems is you would assume that if people were breaking those pieces off as you know talismans to, to take away a bit of the healing power then they would take those off to their settlement you know, and they would have them there, or maybe they would even be buried with them. Well, we haven't found that. We haven't found burials with them, and the settlements are very elusive. So we haven't got the evidence of where those bits of blue stones have gone. And of course, they could have been broken up at any time through prehistory. There is clearly evidence of them being broken up in the in the Roman period or beyond, because even in the early 18th century, the antiquarian William Stukeley um, laments the fact, and he actually does a sketch of people breaking bits off the stones with hammers to take away as souvenirs. And I don't think the people at that time had any idea. They weren't taking them for their healing power. They just wanted a bit of Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. so, they, so they knocked a chunk off and took it away with them. Um, and it is a bit of a puzzle in general as to where missing stones have gone because you know searches have been made of all the local villages to see whether they're built into bridges or foundations and we just don't find them so there isn't the evidence there for them having been taken away as as talismans it's i mean it's an interesting idea but again it's one of those that i think is is very difficult to prove Thank you. We have Fragen here in Plenum. <laughs> so there are a lot of questions in the chat, as I can see, or at least reactions. Let me check that. Maybe I can read some of it to you. Um, uh, do you think it would be worth re-excavating all these graves? Ah. Hawley's graves, yes. Um, these are, they're not actually graves. When Colonel Hawley excavated, I mean, we've already shown that he put all the cremated bones back a few years later in, in an Aubrey hole. And near where his site hut was, he dug pits in which he buried a lot of the finds that he made, including the worked flint and probably a lot of animal bone and antler picks. I've always thought it would be a fascinating thing to do to, to re-excavate these Hawley's graves and see just what he buried, uh, what he buried there. But um, I'm not sure that English heritage are, are very keen on the idea. And of course, you excavate something like that and you've immediately got a very big, well, you'll know from working in a museum, you've got a big conservation problem and a, and a big problem of analysing mm -hmm. them. But I think in terms of completing the story of what we know from previous excavations i think it would be a really interesting thing to do and i'd be quite happy to volunteer to do it <laughs> <laughs> so yes it would it would be an interesting thing to do okay thanks um another question what may what may be the relationship between the stone circle and the great curses which apparently once contained markers near both ends which from the stone circle would also mark specific solar positions Ah, now this is this is where we get into the sort of into the broader landscape and into some of the work mm -hmm. that's been done by the um, Ludwig Boltzmann Institute in their Stonehenge Hidden Landscape project because the there is the suggestion that I mean the, the Greater Cursus is a lot earlier than even the earliest Stonehenge. I mean the Greater Cursus dates to around three thousand five hundred BC, so five hundred years before even the earliest structure at Stonehenge. And geophysical survey has shown two large 
geophysical anomalies, pits within the cursus, um, effectively at, at either end of it, which it's been suggested might be markers that viewed from the heel stone marked specific astronomical alignments. Again, it's a possibility. I have a slight problem with the one that's off to the northwest because it's over the crest of a hill of a slight ridge on which the cursus barrows, the burial mounds, were placed at a later date. So it's not actually visible from Stonehenge. You'd need to have a very, very tall post in that pit to be able to see it from Stonehenge. And you sort mm. of think, well, if you're marking an alignment, why don't you actually have it somewhere where you can see it? And there's also been the suggestion that, oh, well, you'd actually have a, a fire there. So you'd see a pillar of fire and smoke, which, mm, again, I'm not convinced by, <laughs> by that argument. Um, so it's, it's a possibility. But mm -hmm. I, as I say, the fact that it's not actually intervisible from the heelstone at Stonehenge, mm -hmm. I think, suggests that. And of course, we have no idea what date these pits are because they are they exist as geophysical anomalies they haven't been excavated or investigated in any way so we don't know whereabouts in the overall sort of sequence they fit okay. thank you sind hier im saal inzwischen fragen aufgetreten <laughs> wir haben noch mehr im chat also ich kann auch damit weiter aber melden sie sich ruhig Then another question from the chat. Um, you shortly articulated your skepticism regarding the proposition of a roofed Stonehenge. That was exactly the question I was pondering about after visiting the exhibition in Herne a few weeks ago. Do you know of any findings or arguments that are used in support of such a thesis or might the lack thereof be what makes you a bit skeptical about it? So this is a question about these ideas that Stonehenge had a roof on it. Yes. Okay, right. Well, there's no archaeological evidence whatsoever. And you'd think that if there was a large timber structure there, that you'd probably find some post holes or mm -hmm. something. And the two pits, the Y and Z holes that go around the outside, are too shallow and too late to be anything to do with that. And I just can't have it in my you know i can't accept that you build this extraordinary stone structure and then cover it in a timber building you know it's it's just you know the precision of it the the work that's gone into it the you know everything about it are you really going to then just put a roof over the top of it and I mean there's some ladies just written in, in this country has just written a book about this and sort of says well if you were on Salisbury Plain um you know at the winter solstice you know it's cold so you wouldn't want to be outside you'd want to be inside a building and you go hang on a minute the whole point of being there is so that you can observe the sun and what the sun is doing, which you can't do if you're inside a building. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, but I just don't, there's no evidence. And I just think that it's a ridiculous idea. <laughs> so my okay. opinion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I have, I have got to the age where I basically, I'm quite happy just to say, sorry, don't agree with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, I think you have owned the right to do that. <laughs> um, another question are there other examples of significant stones moved over further distances to create a new monumental why is the story of moving always told as an unification and not an aggressive one hmm. interesting um, well no two parts to that I mean no there isn't any other evidence for substantial stones being moved in, in this way you know I mean you've got you've got stone moving around the British Isles because you have a trade in stone axes. So you find stones from the Lake District and Ireland and Cornwall being moved around, but these are small and more portable things. Um, why do we not see it? Why do we see it as an act of unification rather than as an act of aggression? Um, 
I don't know. I suppose because it's very difficult to think how you would aggressively travel to Wales and manage to bring back 84 ton blocks of stone, you know, as a sort of raiding party. You know, I'm not convinced that you actually get away with it because it's not like sort of turning up and stealing somebody's cattle, you know, rustling their cattle or, or you know, you're trying to get away, you know, your, your, your retreat is going to be impeded by the fact that you're trying to drag a four ton stone with you. <laughs> so, and we don't see any real evidence for aggression at this time. The early Neolithic, you know, at the time of the causeway enclosures, yes, we have got evidence there for people attacking and people being killed and, you know, and structures being destroyed. You know, there's clearly territorial conflicts going on at that time. But in the later part of the Neolithic, the structures that we see built, you know, Avebury, Silbury Hill, you know, this building of Stonehenge in stone, I don't see how they can be done in a way that doesn't involve cooperation, you know, and the bringing together of large numbers of people in these communal tasks, which sometimes don't even appear to have a function. You know, it's, it's maybe Silbury Hill near Avebury is the prime example of this, where it doesn't seem to have a function. Why do you build a hill in the bottom of a valley? The idea, maybe, is that it's the act of doing it that is the unifying act and that people then feel that they're part of this great thing. So I, I don't see how, given what we understand of late Neolithic society, that it could have been done in a warlike or aggressive manner. And mm -hmm. that's not me just simply wanting to see prehistory as some sort of mm -hmm. utopia, um, because I don't look at it in that way, but I, I don't see I don't see it being the product of, of conflict and warfare. Okay. okay, thank you. No questions. Um, I think what people are wondering as well um, is uh, you've talked about the um, that moment of the winter solstice, um, which seems to be the main um, moment on which um, Stonehenge is focused. Um, but um, are there other possible functions of the place, for example, just as a meeting point throughout the year where, where people gathered and uh, had celebrations um, throughout the year, not just for the winter sources or the summer sources? Well, yes, there's a, there's a possibility. But of course, we don't have any archaeological evidence for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, if we, if we return to something like, you know, the early Neolithic causeway enclosures, the construction of them may well have been a communal task with groups of people coming in from different areas and maybe each digging a part of the ditch. But then what you find there is deposits of pottery, animal bone, you know, what you could regard as feasting debris, which suggests that people are coming back to those places and they're, they're trading, they're celebrating, they're burying their dead, they're feasting, and they're depositing the, the debris from that in a very organised way. You don't find that at Stonehenge. There aren't a lot of, of finds mm -hmm. from Stonehenge. You know, there's a few bits with the cremation burials, but apart from that, it's antler picks, you know, stone walls, that's it. It's not. A, it doesn't seem to have that evidence. And of course, people could be coming in, carrying out ceremonies, or just simply meeting there, and leaving the place clean and tidy. And we would have no idea about what was going on there. Mm -hmm. I mean, these days at the summer solstice, you know, fifteen thousand people turn up and party there all night, and then in the morning, English Heritage staff and volunteers clear up whatever bits of mess are left around mm -hmm. and there's no evidence of that of that happening and that's the problem with trying to understand what might have happened in the past and yes it could have been used frequently but we haven't got the evidence for it mm -hmm. okay thank you um Another question, do you have uh, any thoughts about why three massive posts were erected nearby in the Mesolithic? 
in the old <laughs> car park. <laughs> Oh, the Mesolithic car park post holes. Yes. Um, oh, no, there, there's a difficult one. Um, for those people who aren't aware of it, when the car park was built in the 1960s, some pits were found, some post holes, which, because they were only, you know, 100 metres away from Stonehenge, was assumed that they must be Neolithic. There must be something to do with it. But the posts, the wooden posts, were, were pine, not the normal oak. And radiocarbon dating suggests, well, proved that they were Mesolithic thousands of years before even the first stage of Stonehenge. These are a real puzzle because up until that time, you know, traditionally people in the Mesolithic didn't construct things like that. And of course, there's the question of what are they? Are they just simply plain posts? Are they carved totem poles? You know, exactly what are they? Um, they're very difficult to understand. Um, you know, recently, the, David Jakes, the person who excavates Blick Mead, suggested that they might have been used as some sort of a structure for corralling animals in hunting. But I, again, I, I'm not so sure. They are very difficult to interpret because they are, well, they're not now unique. We have found one or two other Mesolithic post holes within this broader landscape. But something like that, I, I don't know. I've got no idea. But of course, what's intriguing is that they are on that spot. So clearly, that spot has been significant for thousands of years before Stonehenge appeared. Was it because that sarsen stone was there? Was it because the heel stone was lying there? Was that why it was seen as being a special place? Because by the time Stonehenge was built, those posts had rotted away thousands of years ago and there would have been nothing visible to have actually given a clue as to how people had, had used that landscape all that time ago. So um, I, I don't know. They are, they are an absolute puzzle. If anybody's got any suggestions, I'd be very interested to hear them. <laughs> okay. Um, there's another question. Are there any testimonials that the ancient astronomers had contact to other countries? Um, for example, uh, henches like Hosek and as well as um, um, objects like the Nipra sky disk. Is there any mm -hmm. evidence that there are connections or hints on that? No. <laughs> not sorry, not that not that I'm aware of. Um, this is this is a, a, a question that would be best addressed to an an archaeoastronomer. Um, I'm afraid Simon Banton, the uh, person who wrote with a German colleague, the article for the catalogue isn't here this evening. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there aren't any connections with continental um, astronomical um, observation. So. I'm sorry, I'm not giving a very good answer to that question. But not, as far, not as far as I'm aware. That's fine. Thank I'm you. looking forward to seeing the Nebra Sky Disc at the British Museum next year. Yes, it will be there, I think, from February. Part of the, on part of the big exhibition. New Horizons. Uh, so, yes, so I'll be, I won't have to travel too far to see it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any more questions? Weitere Fragen? The audience here on site is just in awe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see more questions in the chat. He is here, it's me. Is that Simon Benton? <laughs> somebody, <laughs> oh, Simon. Si yeah, somebody uh, yeah, wrote in the chat that he is here, it's me. Oh, is Simon there? Arkin 3, sir. <laughs> Username. Maybe that's him. <laughs> well, maybe Simon can answer the question. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. So, Julian, again, thank you very much for your exciting and entertaining talk. Um, I think I can speak for the audience, for all of us, that we really, really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, to our audience as well um, here on site and in the live stream, thank you very much for your participation. 
Um, if you have not yet seen our exhibition, please come and visit us in Herne and uh, have a look at our original finds and also at, uh, of course, our one-on-one -on -one rep replica of Stonehenge. Um, I'm sure when you see the dimensions here and if, when you experience them, um, you will be amazed once again by what the people achieved um, around about 5,000 years ago. Our next lecture will be on November 18th. Um, then Dr. Leo Klinker from the Antiqu Antiquities Commission of Westphalia and Dr. Kerstin Schierholt, the project manager for this exhibition, um, will present uh, you which monuments were built in Westphalia at the same time at Stonehenge and um, what their meaning might have been. And we would be delighted if you would join us um, at this evening as well. The talk will be in German then. Also nochmal ganz herzlichen Dank für Ihre Teilnahme. Falls Sie die Ausstellung noch nicht gesehen haben, besuchen Sie uns hier in Herne. Schauen Sie sich die Originalfunde aus der Umgebung von Stonehenge an, aber vor allem natürlich auch unsere 1 zu 1 Replik der Steine. Ich bin sicher, wenn Sie die Dimensionen hier nochmal erleben, dann kriegen Sie auch nochmal einen besonderen Respekt davor, was die Leute da vor viereinhalb, 5000 Jahren geschafft haben. Und ähm, unser nächster Vortrag wird am 18. November sein. Dann äh, sprechen Dr. Leo Klinke von der Altertumskommission für Westfalen und Dr. Kerstin Schierholt, die äh, Projektleiterin für die Sonderausstellung, über die Monumente, die zeitgleich zu Stonehenge hier in Westfalen gebaut worden sind und was deren Bedeutung war. Also wir würden uns sehr freuen, wenn Sie an dem Abend auch wieder zahlreich teilnehmen. Und bis dahin wünsche ich Ihnen noch einen schönen Abend. Kommen Sie gut nach Hause bei dem Sturm. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank nochmal und bis zum nächsten Mal. Goodbye.